this is Christy Ruskowski. I'm with the program committee at Champaign County Master Gardeners. Welcome to everybody. I'd like to remind you to do a couple of things. Uh, please keep your video off so that we get good reception. Keep your mics muted so we don't hear what's going on in your private lives. And um, if you have questions, please submit them via chat and we will monitor the chat and pass those questions on to our speaker. At the end of this program, we will have a poll asking your reaction to what was presented. We would really appreciate if you would take a couple minutes and complete that poll because we do look at that regularly in making our decisions on future programs. Um, it is my honor tonight to introduce our speaker. He is Richard Hockey the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Director of Ornamental Plant Research at Chicago Botanic Garden. He's the horticulture graduate of the University of Wisconsin. I know, at least it's a Big Ten school. <laughs> he uh, leads the ornament, ornamental plant research program at the Chicago Botanic Garden, where he also serves as an instructor. Mr. Hockey's research focuses on comparative evaluations of herbaceous perennials, vines, and shrubs in a landscape setting in an effort to identify those best suited as garden plants for the upper Midwest, which would include our local Champaign County. It's a rigorous process that requires at least four years for each perennial, six years for vines and shrubs. Results are published regularly in plant evaluation notes. For many years, he has also been a regular contributing author to Fine Gardening Magazine, where he has written most recently on bush clover, allium, and nine bark shrubs. And he is also the president elect of the Perennial Plant Association Board of Directors. We are delighted that he has made time in his busy schedule to share with us results on this year's perennial plant evaluations. Mr. Hockey. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to be in my living room. Uh, and I'm glad you guys all have, have, have shown up in your living rooms as well. And, and thanks to those who, who traveled to get to the, to the event. So what I wanted to do tonight um, is talk about a, a, a variety of perennials that have done well or are doing well in our trials. And that's sort of where the title of this talk, Proving Their Worth, comes from. It is a trial. So even though uh, we have a lot of opinions as horticulturists, it really, there really is a rigorous evaluation behind all of the plants that I'm going to talk about. But I want to start by first giving a little bit of a background on our program. Um, I'm sure some of you have been to the Chicago Botanic Garden. Uh, this is our main trial garden. Uh, it's been around since 1989. Our program, uh, I've managed our program since 1985 uh, when the, the, the program really started. Our, um, this is the full sun garden. So we, we have uh, um, the majority of our, our perennials uh, for the last number of years have been centered here, but I'll talk about our other garden in a minute, as well as on the green roof, which is on the plant science center in the back of the, the image. Uh, if you look to the right of the screen, uh, that's where you will see our our newest evaluation garden, and this is a full or this is a shade evaluation garden. Uh, I can't technically say it's full shade; it's really light shade at this point because all of our shade is coming from uh, natural shade, uh, from trees uh, and shrubs and things that might protect the plants below. So this is a, a, a effectively tripled the size of our evaluation program by the addition of this garden, which opened this past spring. Um, it is It has a lot more structure, uh, and a lot of what you're seeing in that image is actually structure, hedges and trees and things. And then our, our perennial plants are sort of interspersed in the, in the open areas in between. And, and contrary to what it looks like in this picture, it has been fully planted at this point and plants have really come on well. Now in this trial, we're gonna have a lot more opportunity for microclimate testing. Um, and, uh, and again, of course, shade in the, in the future. Uh, it's just a quick list of what's currently in our trials. Uh, we have had as few as five uh, trials underway and as many as 40. 
Uh, this is our offering now. You can see it's predominantly herbaceous perennials, although we, we do have the ability, especially now with this new shade garden, we have, we have an option to look at more woody plants, uh, shrubs, and, and certainly some vines as well. Um, and the ones that are highlighted there in yellow are the ones that were are new this year. They were planted in uh, May of this year. So the evaluation criteria are are the the four main reasons or the ways we evaluate these plants. So the first criterion is looking at the cultural adaptability of the soil and environment in which these plants grow in. So this is important because it really doesn't matter how much you like the plant or how beautiful you think the plant is if we can't successfully grow it. So we want to look when we're, we're measuring these plants and deciding if they've done well, we want to first and foremost consider that they are adaptable to the conditions we put them in. Winter hardiness, of course, very important. Uh, when I first came to the garden, um, winter hardiness uh, was our only criterion. If it lived through winter, we uh, we all agreed it was a great plant, and we and we we utilized it in our in our uh, developing uh, display garden. Uh, but winter hardiness goes beyond just cold hardiness. For us, it's all of the aspect of winter: the the freeze and thaw, the snow cover, the lack of snow cover, the desiccating winds, the the heating, all of that aspect wet soils, winter wet soils, all of that goes into winter hardiness, not just cold temperatures. Disease and pest resistance, of course, very important. We would like to be able to say that the plants that have done well are resistant to diseases and pests. Um, and then, of course, the final criterion is ornamental and habit traits. This is the flowers, foliage, and habit of the plant, all the reasons why you want this plant, all the beautiful aspects of it. So we're measuring all of those characteristics uh, over the course of four years for perennials. We think that's a, a fairly good um, amount of time to get a great feeling for these plants. Uh, in some cases, it's, it's too long. In other cases, it's not enough time. We found where we've left trials in, in the ground that in the fifth year, we've see, we saw things that we didn't see up until then, and, and that in some cases were not a positive. Uh, Six-year trial for shrubs and vines. Uh, limited maintenance, very important. We, we have decided from the very beginning, we wanted to do to these plants what we think the average homeowner would do. So we water the plants when it's, when it's needed, and that's pretty much it. Uh, we do mulch the beds for water conservation. We do weed uh, for ornamental, uh, the, the, the visual of the garden, but we don't deadhead, we don't, we don't uh, divide, we don't stake, we don't treat for any disease or pests. Uh, so we just put the plants in the ground. If they succeed with no care or very limited care, that's a boon. That, that's a, I think that's a sustainable thing these plants have going for them. And then, of course, we are, because we're in very near Lake Michigan, we are in USDA Hardiness Zone 5B, um, at least for right now. Uh, and then at the end of our trials, we do reporting and publication on what we have done. Our primary sort of research report is plant evaluation notes. Um, and that's our publication that we produce in-house it gives you all of the details of what the trial involved. And this is published now only on our website. It's downloadable. Um, we used to print it, uh, became cost too costly. And, and so now we're just, it's available as a PDF uh, on our website. And then uh, as mentioned, we have been working with, with Fine Gardening since for about 12 years now. Uh, it was actually originally meant to be a two year program, but uh, it has become very popular with their readers. And so we continue to work with them. Um, and this gives us a great opportunity to reach another audience, um, the homeowner, the, the average gardener. We also do publish regularly in the Landscape Contractor Magazine, which is um, the Illinois Landscape Contractor Association. Uh, so it's, that's more to the trade. Uh, and then our information, of course, gets picked up in a myriad of ways and, and distributed in that in that way. All right, so onto the list. This is the this a list of plants are things that have done well in our trials. 
currently in our trials or just out of our trials. So some of these uh, have finished their trial. A few of them are still under trial, but have proven themselves to be uh, good plants and, and worthy of being talked about at this point. I put a lot of information on the handout, so hopefully you have that in front of you. Uh, and if you don't, know that you can get it and it will, it will cover a lot of the points uh, that I'm gonna make and, and certainly a lot of points I won't make. I'm not gonna just do a litany of what these plants are about. I'm gonna talk a little bit broader and about characteristics of the plant and performance of the plant uh, based on the whole trial, not necessarily just this individual plant. Uh, so first up is Augustachi, Rosie Posey. You know, Augustachi is one of those trials that I have wanted to do an enormous trial of for years, but I know that they're not going to be universally good for, for the Midwest. Even though they're generally hardy to zone five, uh, it's more about the climate beyond just the temperature. It's about the soils and the water and all of that stuff. So what we've had great luck with over the years are the blue or purple flowered Agastache, less so the bright colors, the pinks, the reds, yellows, oranges. So when I find one that's not blue, that's actually persistent, uh, which is an important word, and you'll probably hear me say it more than once tonight, uh, I'm really happy. And Rosie Posey is one of those. One thing I do want to point out, and I'll probably mention this multiple times too, because at my at my core, I guess I'm kind of a botanical nerd. So I like all the little, the little things that maybe the average person isn't thinking about. But in the case of the mint family, which is what Agastache is in, the calyx or that part of the flower, that part of the flower that the actual flower sits in is often uh, different color than the flower, enhances the flower color, really sometimes is the bigger part of the flower show. So in this case, in Rosy Poet, it has that really dark rosy pink coloration and then the lighter pink flower. Uh, and you can, this is typical of this as well, where there's not always a lot of flowers open at once. So you kind of rely a lot on that uh, darker calyx color. There it is in our trial. It's a very compact little plant, at best two feet by two feet, perfect little mound has done really had done really well for us in our in our heavy clay soils uh, where that can be periodically wet both in winter and summer. The kiss of death for Agastache, other than really the purple ones and the blue ones, is is um, uh, winter wetness more even so than summer wetness. Although that's not a a good thing either. But this one has persisted and I think is is proven to be a really nice little plant. Uh, lavender, Allium Lavender Bubbles. Um, I recently did an article for Fine Gardening on Allium, sort of previewing our Allium trial. This is a newer selection, but is proven at this point to be really good, even though it's not been in the trial for a long time. It's probably most comparable to Millennium, which has been around for a long time. I think the main difference here is the flowers are darker. They bloom a little bit later start blooming a little bit later than Millennium. And it has a twisty blue-green leaf versus Millennium that has a nice dark green leaf and, and very straight. But this, this is a really nice one. I mean, these are amazing pollinator plants, the alliums in general, really nice pollinator plants. All right, Amsonia ciliata, variety tenuifolia, verdant venture, ridiculously long name. This is one of our selections, our, our previous plant um, breeder, Jim Alt, uh, developed this. Um, it, it's one of the blue stars and it has the very pale blue star shaped flowers in the springtime. And it's literally covered with them. It's a little mounding plant. It only gets about 28 inches tall, but gets to about five feet wide. Now in a garden setting where it has competition, it won't get that width. But uh, and it may get a little taller, but grown all on its own, it it has for us in the 10 to 12 years it's been in in the breeding program and in the trial, uh, it's it's topped out at about five feet wide. But like all all blue stars, you can see this this new growth starts as the flowers just about reach peak. New growth starts growing up through it. So the more flowers you have, the longer that bloom is um, interesting because uh, eventually the foliage covers up probably maybe the last quarter, sometimes even a third of the bloom, it's covered up by that new foliage, which vigorously comes up through. 
So it's a very fine textured sort of thread-like leaf. Here it is in the fall. You know, Amsonias are known for one being a perennial that has a great fall color. And in this case, it is quite good. It's a nice golden yellow. It's that short stature that makes this different than anything else in the market. And it, it is, this has drawn so much interest from our visitors, in particular, our professional nurserymen and contractors who really like this plant. Uh, Andropogon gerardii, Blackhawks. Um, this is an introduction from Brent Horvath, who's at Intrinsic Perennials uh, up near the Wisconsin border. Um, he has done an amazing job with um, creating unique and, and superior um, big blue stem cultivars. Blackhawks, one of his latest ones, it's probably his smallest. It, it tops out at about five feet. It's incredibly dark. It's, not, it's really kind of almost too dark to photograph well, which is why I think I dumped a bunch of pictures in there hoping you can get a good feel for this plant. Here it is early in the season where it's got a lot of green in it and you can start seeing a lot of that, that purple coming on. Here it is later, if you can see that, how dark it is. The foliage is dark purple or dark burgundy uh, purple color. The, um, the stems and the inflorescence are almost black. They're so dark. Uh, and it's a, it's a fairly see-through plant. It's not really dense. Uh, it's probably best if you can position it against something white, I think it would be really amazing with a backdrop of like, uh, as you can see in the back of this picture, not quite too far away to be a backdrop in this picture, but the, the panicle hydrangea where you get that wonderful white flower and this dark color against it. Uh, here it is used um, in mass and makes a great plant, always stands up, doesn't fall over. Um, again, a little bit see-through, but it just intensifies as the season goes on. That color just gets darker and darker. But by a certain point near the late summer, the foliage at the base starts to brown out. So the color late in the season comes mostly from the stems and the inflorescence that really are uh, pretty amazing. By comparison, uh, Dancing Wind is another one of Brent's introductions. And this is probably my favorite. I, I really like Blackhawks a lot, but this one, is big. This is more in the six, six and a half foot range. Uh, it's it's bulky. It's it's big. It's got this. Uh, it's got really green leaves that ha may have some purple coloration in them, but it, re it really shines as this purple, red, and coppery stem, and then topped by these amazing deep red purple flowers. And it 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 appropriately a dancing wind. It, the movement of these plants in the wind is really quite special. Uh, wonderful, wonderful group of plants. I, I think Brent has has really put these plants on the on the gardener's uh, mind. Uh, they've been used forever for forage plants and agriculture, but but the, these a lot of his new stuff is really outstanding. Estrantia major, sparkling stars pink. This is um, one of the master warts. We have done a trial of master warts uh, twice. We're currently doing one. Uh, capturing up all the newest stuff that's that's come on in, in recent years. I think, you know, the, the estranches are such an interesting flower. They're like little pin cushions. And a lot of the color comes from these sort of papery bracts that, that surround it. And you can always see a little bit of green and a little bit of netting. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting inflorescence. And you see all the little flowers there coming out of the center. Um, because they're sort of um, vegetative more than floral, this outer part, the color stays longer than it might on a regular flower. Uh, here it is, oh, this is why and the flower is so beautiful, but that habit, that robust, uh, healthy, vigorous habit in full sun. These tend to like a moist, semi-shady site. But I've got all mine in full sun. And as long as water isn't limited, these plants have done quite well. But this by far is the sort of king of them all in, in the sense that it's, it's been the most robust for us to, to date. Uh, and it's been in the ground for at least four years. It's about a little over two feet tall and wide. So it's really uh, quite a nice plant. And it blooms for a long time, blooms from early June into September. They will seed around though, so just be aware of that. If it's happy, it will seed around. Uh, 
Another um, newish um, plant is Botanica officinalis summer romance. This used to be, and probably in most literature, is still showing up as Stachys officinalis, but Stachys um, officinalis has been has changed has had a name change. Um, if you know Humalo, this will look very familiar. Uh, again, it's in the mint family. It's got the bright uh, sort of magenta purple flowers, but then you can see in there the darker calyx. So you have that sort of two-tone effect. Here it is. It differs from Humalo. It's a, it's a little bit taller. It's definitely more robust. The inflorescence, the length of the inflorescence is a little bit longer to actually a, a quite a bit longer. So the, the floral effect is, is bigger than, um, than uh, uh, Humalo. And behind it is its sibling Summer Crush, which is the two-tone pink. Uh, I like the flower a lot. Uh, it's actually reminiscent and very similar to an introduction I made a number of years ago called uh, Pink Cotton Candy. Um, but it's um, it can be a little more open. It can be a little floppy. So it doesn't have the strength of its uh, sibling summer romance. Uh, Calamagrostis jejudo is a grass that you will probably only find by mail order. And if you're really interested in a digging dog nursery in California, Great mail order catalog. You pay a lot for the the shipping, but it's it's you get a nice healthy plant from them. Might be the only place you find it. Uh, at least now it's starting to get out more. It is unlike uh, Carl Furster, which a lot of people grow, at, which you can see here on the left on the right side of this picture. Uh, that's what what's more typical of Calamagrostis in the landscape. This is a little bit more. Of, it's more of a mounded plant. It has a feathery, feathery uh, uh, inflorescence or flower that constricts, but it doesn't constrict like you see in, in the, the Carl Furster. Um, and, and all the leaves, the leaves are covered in, in silvery hairs. So the whole plant has a little silvery cast to it, especially in, the, in a bright sunny day. Uh, and then later in the season, um, and this one again is only about uh, 32 inches tall. There it is later in the season. It takes on these nice sort of russet tan and gold uh, color in the foliage. This is this is what it looks like uh, right about now. And it, it will hold this color uh, into the early winter. Uh, cone flowers are a, a, a plant group that I've been evaluating since 1985. Um, in those early years, we learned a couple of very valuable things to know about purple coneflower. Number one, it's very short-lived. Typically, two to three years is all you're going to get out of a, a plant. A lot of people, and I'm sure some of you are saying, wait, I've had that for 20 years. You've had its progeny, and it's, it's progeny, it's progeny, and on and on and on. Many generations. It, it will reseed readily. It reseeds often right inside itself. So you, the next year it will come up again. You'll think, oh, this is just going on and on, but it's really just per perpetuating itself. Well, the hybrids are more easy to, to understand their short-lived because when the hybrid goes away, the seed often is pink. So on something like this, where you have a yellow flower, if it reseeds, it may very well come out pink. Uh, but on the positive side, the breeding in, in the last, 10 years has gotten so much better than the early years uh, of this of the hybrid hybridization of cone flowers that the plants are a little bit longer lived they're they definitely have a better quality in their habit um, and great flower colors I love this one sombrero summer solstice uh, that's the one thing you know although this the um, there's a lot of plants that do really well I still as as the evaluator and the speaker get to choose the ones I like to talk about directly, although there's plenty others I could put in here instead of this. I like this plant because that's such a beautiful color. I have always said, you know, what's the point of a yellow cone flower? We have Rudbeckia for that. Well, this is definitely not Rudbeckia yellow. This is a beautiful yellow. And you can see that light pale color right around the, the, the cone. That's just a, such a delicate color. But what I love about this is that its early color 
is amazing, but even its old late summer color, the way it fades is still it's still attractive. It's still a pretty color. Uh, and you can see that in both cases, there's it's not just one color. There's a mix of colors, uh, the old and the new. Um, now, eventually, these will turn brown like all of them, and they're just all ugly. But leave them up because the goldfinches and other birds love to feed off the seeds. So don't deadhead them unless, unless you just can't live with that. But what's happened with the breeding over the years is the plants have gotten sturdier. They've gotten bulkier, more foliage, uh, stronger habit. And that's all a positive for, for coneflowers. Uh, the Sombrero series, uh, which is a ball uh, horticulture or Darwin perennials uh, breeding group um, has, has been good across the board. It's a really superior plant breeding in this, in this series. A geranium pretensi boom chocolata. By the way, I never thought I would say that in out loud in a group, but boom chocolata is um, is a really kind of amazing plant. It's I tend to like to talk about geraniums that you don't have to do anything with the ones that flower, and when they're done flowering, the plant remains attractive. This is one of the other geraniums that once they bloom the plant starts looking shabby and needs to be reinvigorated by cutting, at least deadheading it, if not cutting it right down to the ground. Um, so here it is in flower. It's got these beautiful blue purple flowers uh, and you can't really see it there, but I think you can see a little better on there. It's got an, the, the leaf has got an overlay of a sort of a chocolatey color. It's not a, it's not a dark purple leaf, although early in the season, it can almost before flowers even come up, it can read as being fairly dark um, uh, burgundy or purple. But as the summer goes on, the, the color fades out. So here you can see it in early June when it's at peak bloom. Uh, this one it's in high, it's a very upright, narrow plant, really 32 inches tall, beautiful effect, continues blooming for quite a while. And you can see here it's winding down in early August. Not long after this, when you get down to just a handful of flowers, my suggestion is just top it, get rid of all that twiggy growth at the top. You can also, by the way, cut it all the way to the ground and it will bush out, but it's kind of late in the season and cutting it back at that point makes it, it makes it expend energy that's not really necessary. But just, you know, shave those, shear those, uh, those dead heads off and I think you'll be fine for the rest of the for the rest of the season. Uh, hookera silver gumdrop. I have I rarely speak of hookeras. Hookeras are actually the, the the genus that started our trial program, really was the one that said, you know, we've got to look at these. There's so many of them coming out. We should look at these to see which ones are the best ones. So other than those original plants back in the, the mid 80s that I looked at, I've never purchased a hookra. They come to me all the time. Other companies send them. And I never asked for them because I, I just never felt like I could grow them well. And I think I'm not alone. But again, like so many things, the competition has, re has made better breeding a necessity. And I think the breeding that's gone into a lot of the new ones are it's so much better than they were 20 years ago. And in the case of silver gumdrop, it's, it's really an amazing thing. Here it is. It's got a uh, silvery and burgundy leaf. So it has a little bit of a burgundy tint to it, but it's generally silvery top, but very dark purple or burgundy underside. And in this case, it does have a nice dark pink flower and it flowers well and reliably. And so it's not just a foliage plant. Here's its glamour shot. This is a, this originated at Walters Gardens in Michigan. And this is what they use to sell to their customers. Well, here it is in our garden. Um, with all the negative aspects of our garden, the weeds, those those enormous cracks that you can see at the bottom of the, the thing, dry, nasty soil. This is on a Western exposure. This gets hot late afternoon sun. Look at that plant. I mean, it's probably not the most positive thing to say that a plant looks plastic, but this is such a durable, attractive plant. It almost looks fake, but you can see it. Here it is it's it's just a beautiful plant. I, I can't say enough about it. It's become 
one of my absolute favorite plants uh, and not just tucaras. It's so reliable and, and again, so beautiful. When it's done flowering, you can deadhead it or not deadhead it and you'll get that, that foliage stays nice through the, through the entire season. Uh, hibiscus, we've grown a lot of hibiscus. Hibiscus were a plant group that I, one of my initial plant groups when I built, when we built this, this trial garden in 1989. And I've had them in the garden consecutively. I've never not had hibiscus because there's been so much breeding over the years. And they, they bred them from, you know, really tall plants with flowers just on the top to plants that are much shorter, bushier with flowers that just cover the plant from top to bottom. And so I've looked at a lot and I think the breeding that's out there now is really quite good. This is the only um, variegated one that I'm aware of. This is summer carnival. And you can see the variegation is strongest at the terminals. Um, and you can see the buds in there, the buds are variegated as well. The flower does come out um, that dark magenta pink uh, fairly flat, so they get to be about seven inches across. But that cut foliage, or that you know that uh, low, all those lobed and cut foliage, plus that addition of the um, the variegation and the softer green, it's almost a gray green, and plus the addition of those flowers, it's really quite nice. This one gets about uh, four, maybe forty-four inches, and maybe four feet wide. Um, so they are kind of mid-level and broad. They're very shrub-like. And it, one thing to remember about these hibiscus, they come up very late in the spring. So it's best to leave a stub so you know where it is, so you can keep an eye on it and don't dig it up by accident. Uh, great, great plants. Uh, Lychnus, uh, Petite Jenny. Uh, I love this plant. It's not easy to find. It is out there. It's probably mail order is gonna be your easiest route. Uh, it's a double flowered ragged robin. Um, it's got those wonderful bright pink, kind of like the Zucca Joe bubblegum pink. But if you look, it's also got these calyxes that are striped in purple and then the purple stem that bleeds down into a green stem. But so when you get right on the flower, it's very delicate and, and beautiful. But when it's in mass, as a plant, that's what it looks like. It has a very fine textured foliage and the whole plant looks more like, like a grass until it flowers. And that's what it looks like when it's in flower. And typically for us, that was about a month and up to a month and a half of flowers at that level. It will repeat bloom periodically or sporadically to the end of the season, but that strongest bloom for us is early, in early June into mid July. Now the only downside that I that I we've seen on this plant is because those flowers are double. You can imagine there's more surface space to hold moisture. So if you have a really heavy rain accompanied by wind or your ear overhead irrigating, it can pull these plants down. Now if it's not a prolonged situation, it will come back up. If it's prolonged it might not. And in those cases, my suggestion is to just cut it back near the ground. It will reflush, put on a little bit of flowers, not this, but then you don't have to deal with a floppy, floppy mess. It was not common, but it can happen, something to consider. Uh, Mulambergia, uh, this is the, um, the cultivar Undaunted. This is actually a selection and introduction from the um, Plant Select program out in Colorado. It was, um, it was introduced as a xeric plant, a plant that likes less water and, and even a droughty situation. So, and it's, and it's zoned for five. So I knew it would be hardy for us, but I figured its hardiness would decrease because it would hate our wet soil. Does not mind our wet soil. This thing, has grown so beautifully uh, over the years. It gets about 40 inches tall and about 60 inches wide. It blooms in the late summer. And you can see the flower here. It's a very filament type flower, pink, uh, sort of a rosy pink, very fine textured. Here you can see it backlit by the sun. It's just, it's a stunning, stunning plant. 
Uh, I love it just by accident. We put Sunset Boulevard Cheatham next to it. Uh, and it's, and by the way, Sunset, I can't speak to it from the point of view of a plant because they do not like our wet clay soils, but that flower color is the best sedum flower color I have ever seen. It is so beautiful. So if you have good luck with sedum, I would try Sunset Boulevard because that color is spectacular. It's such a great color. I get even Lime Joy. It's such a great color echo with the grass and, and a completely different feeling because it's, it's not a wispy sort of thing like the grass. And then late in the season, that's what it looks like. So in early November, right around now, this is what we're starting to see. You can still see a little bit of pink in it. Uh, I love the fact that there's this, that sedum again, it's a color echo still. Even that faded flower on there still echoes to, to this, but look how beautiful that is. And it stays up like that for a lot of the winter. The snow doesn't necessarily knock it back. And it has thrived for us. It is not one of those that keeps getting smaller over the years. It is it has really just been a phenomenal uh, doer in our in our soil conditions. Uh, Nepeta, I've done a lot of Nepetas. I, I kind of like this one because it's not the gray gray leaved one. It's not the the cat mint that most people think of. Uh, Neptune is a is one of the green leaved ones. Um, it is uh, it's again uh, in the mint family. So you can see it has that dark purple calyx. And then those dark blue, uh, purple blue, that's not technically blue, purple blue flowers, which are really so, it's so beautiful together. Here it is in, in its, um, in its uh, trial, in the trial, you can see it's a good flower production, good flower coverage or, you know, where positioned on the plant. So it really is, it really is a, a good looking uh, plant when it's in flower. It gets about 28 inches tall and a little wider than that. For us, it blooms from mid-June to um, early September. Behind it, you're, you, the plant here and the plant behind it, the light pink, those are uh, also really nice, um, big um, cat mints. Uh, they're called Whisper Blue and Whisper Pink. Uh, Whisper Blue is a hardier plant. It's a little bit more robust than pink, but both are really quite good. Um, a little bit different leaf, a darker green, gray green leaf, not this, this lighter uh, green leaf that you see on Neptune. Uh, Oreganum, Drops of Jupiter. Um, I, you know, I, I actually was kind of surprised that I would want to talk so much about this. But it really is a phenomenal plant. I mean, it, a lot of people would consider Oreganum as herbs, in this case, it is a it is an ornamental, um, and uh, it's got that. It's a bright yellow leaf early in the spring, and then it becomes kind of chartreuse with yellow, sort of bright yellow accents uh, during the summer months. Here you see early in the season, you can see a lot of the yellow. Um, little mounded, little mounded plants. Ultimately, for us, it gets about. 33 inches tall, but as it's grown and, and been in the ground longer, it actually maxes out at 48 inches wide. So it's not a, a tiny little plant. Here it is in our trial uh, when it's in flower, beautiful flowers. It's purple pink flowers with again, the dark purple calyx that adds so much interest to that, to that flower. And they bloom for a long time, late June to mid October. They just keep putting out flowers. And even when the flowers have fallen, the calyx remains dark purple and really is quite phenomenal. Here it is as it gets into the late season, the, the, uh, the leaf recolors up or sort of brightens up again. It becomes much more golden as it gets into the late season. You can still see some of the color remnant on the inflorescences. This is when it was an early, a young plant. So it looks a little flatter here than the other ones. Uh, over over the years, it's gotten much bigger, in it, but it still does this. But what was interesting to me, or is interesting to me, cover this with snow all winter, and when the snow melts, it still looks like this, except the inflorescences are black. Otherwise, the leaves are still bright yellow. Uh, it's a pretty phenomenal plant. Persistent again, it's not one that's going to die out. Perfectly happy in our heavy clay, uh, occasionally wet soils. Beautiful and a great accent. I don't know if you can see really see it here. 
right along the edge is a, a really dark, almost black leaved crepe myrtle, uh, marginally hardy for us, but it comes up and that dark color against that yellow color is so spectacular. All right, so Penstemon, uh, Allopecoroides, uh, hush puppy. Um, this is one of the theories that comes from down, down south and was down University of Georgia bred for sterility. Um, and and steril, being bred for sterility doesn't necessarily mean it produces no seed. Sometimes it just means it produces minimal seed. In this case, I have never seen a seedling of it. So I'm gonna go on the, 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 with the idea that it, it is truly sterile. There's a whole series of these hush puppy, cayenne, uh, etouffee, um, praline, and I'm missing one in there. Uh, in the scheme of that group, this is a this is a fairly compact variety. Uh, for us, it's 56 inches tall and wide, which, by comparison, is actually kind of small uh, to the others. Here you're seeing it in its leaf in September or in its flower. Sorry, in September, it doesn't have the darkest flowers. Some of them have almost dark burgundy, almost black. Uh, flowers. This one is a lighter sort of pink to purple, but very pretty. You can see a lot of sort of um, tan in there, which is kind of nice. It's starting to uh, put on fall color here because it is late in the season. There it is in early November. The one thing to remember with Penicetum, they have really no winter interest. Uh, I mean, unless you think that's interesting because it does hold that, but the flowers shatter. They don't hold that that fountain um, or that bristly inflorescence for very long into the season. By early November, they're usually fully shattered. And it does have a little fall color and it, and it, it tends to be smashed down by the, by, the, um, by the winter, but I would still leave it up till spring and, and cut it back in the springtime. Uh, Rudbeckia, this is Rudbeckia American Gold Rush. Um, I have said for the last number of years that I think this might be one of, certainly to me is the best uh, Rudbeckia or Black-Eyed Susan of this type that I've ever grown. And by, by far one of the best overall perennials that I've ever grown. It just ticks every box in a positive way. It, here it is. Uh, this is what I like about it. The flower is gold, but it's not brassy gold like Goldstern. It does have a bit of a, a reddish tint around the cone. The ray florets or petals droop, which I think is more interesting. And if you, I think you can see on this image, the stems, the leaves, everything is covered with hair, uh, little bristly hairs. And what that, what that does twofold, from, a, from a, a little bit of a distance makes everything look silvery, but more importantly, it protects this plant from septoria leaf spot, which is a very devastating disease of plants uh, like Goldstern, it, you know, where they get all the black lesions on the leaves and then they just start dying out. Uh, not a pretty picture and certainly not something you want in your landscape. This one is resistant to that and largely because of the the fuzziness of the of the foliage. But here's here's where it just, I mean, it's a perfect mounted plant produces, I mean, look at the look at the flower power on that. It's about, you know, 30 inches tall and 40 inches wide. If you were on top of this plant on the day this was taken, it looks like it's just a solid gold over silver. It's such a beautiful, beautiful um, color. It was um, I forgot to mention, it is the perennial plant of the year, year next year. The Perennial Plant Association uh, votes on, on these. And this, this was awarded at this, this summer at our annual meeting. But a, a couple years ago, it won the All-America selection. Uh, it was one of the first perennials that ever won the uh, All-America, um, uh, All-Americas, which is, is pretty impressive. Uh, but there it is, beautiful plant. One thing to keep in mind, which we didn't see for the first few years we've looked at this, is it will reseed. So it, it's not, um, uh, it's not free. It's not, you know, there, that might be a, a less of a tick, uh, you know, as far as the positive boxes. 
but they, they tended to be all underneath the plant. So that it didn't have a wide dispersal, uh, which I think is a positive. All right, uh, Salvia. Um, oh, I am missing one. I'm sorry about that. I, I, I apparently have missed the Salvia nemorosa rose marvel. So uh, look it up if you can. It's a great, great plant. I'm not sure how I, I've looked at this dozens of times. I'm not sure why I missed it. But anyway, we'll move on to the next Salvia, which is Salvia yangii blue steel. And probably a lot of you are looking and saying, well, that's not Salvia, that's a perovskia. And you'd be right, it is a perovskia, but that has since been absorbed into the salvia. And, and so instead of being perovskia atroplicifolia, it is now salvia yangii. Blue steel is a seed grown cultivar. And so the, the, the positive side of that is it's seed grown, it is uniform. So it's not, if you buy multiple of these, they won't be all over the place. It's um, performed as well, or even some cases better than clones, the, the cultivars that, that are produced asexually. And you're gonna buy it at a cheaper price because it isn't, it isn't a clonal thing. It, it, or, um, uh, it's not asexual, it's not, um, uh, micropropagation. So it's a cheaper thing to produce. So you should pay a little less for it. But nice, nice plant. Again, typical um, uh, mint family plant. And in this case, it's really the majority of the color on the, on the salvia yangii comes from the calyx, not from the flowers. The flowers are erratically produced. You've got every 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 inflorescence is loaded with flowers, but they they open randomly. But throughout it all are the fuzzy dark purple blue uh, calyx, and that will hold even long after the flowers have quit quit opening. That color will hold on it, and then you combine that with that silvery uh, foliage. It's really quite nice. In the case of uh, blue steel. Uh, maybe about 32 inches tall, uh, maybe a little bit wider. Uh, Sanguisorba, hacustinensis, uh, lilac squirrel, a little more esoteric than a lot of the plants I've mentioned. Uh, probably another one you may have to get from a mail order source, at least for now. I, it's becoming, this is this as a group is becoming much more popular. Um, so lilac squirrel has these wonderful arching pink flowers um, that have a, a really nice sort of uh, textural quality to them as well as sort of a uh, kind of an elegant look as they arch out away from the plant. Uh, these eventually elongate to about six to eight inches. So it's quite dramatic. Uh, here it is. You can see the, the plant, it, wonderful blue, blue green leaf very, even if it never flowered, it's a beautiful foliage plant, um, but it flowers and it's nice. Now, I will say, as much as I love this plant, excess water, either through irrigation or really heavy rainstorm, will pull it down, especially in flower. Again, like as I mentioned with that lickness, those inflorescences just become saturated, and until they dry out, it can't sort of bounce back. Um, and so sometimes those flowers end up being further away and a lower on the plant because of heavy, heavy uh, irrigation or, or something like that. So, um, but it's a beautiful plant, nice blue green leaf, has a fairly compact habit, gets about 38 inches tall and wide. That's inclusive of the flowers and inclusive also of the width of the flowers. So the plant itself is a smaller thing um, and, and well worth looking for. Uh, and then on the other side of the spectrum, uh, we've got Sanguisorba officinalis microcephala little angel. And little angel is a uh, variegated, has these gray green leaves with that really nice creamy white margin. And that's quite variable. I think if you look in there, you'll see it's some, it's just the edge, others, it's half the leaf. It's quite variable, but it's strong enough that you do notice it. Uh, so here, to, that's the leaf. You can see it's a tiny little leaf. If you took this and put it next to that other leaf, the similarity is there, um, but it's on a much, much smaller level. There it is in its flower. 
it has these tiny little purple red sort of magenta flowers little look like little drum drum stick heads so but they're they're produced above the plant ultimately this probably gets maybe 15 inches tall 13 15 inches tall but that's in flower minus the flowers is probably more at seven or eight inches tall so it's a really nice really dense nice little mound of plant gets about uh, almost two feet wide uh, it has a little bit of reversion but not not particularly problematic but there that's the flower effect when it's when it's bright and the new flowers here it is a little later you can see that habit how wide it is and how obvious that that um, uh, variegation is so it, it's not a it's not one that just sort of eh, is that variegated isn't it it really is variegated now I have never noticed any deer dam any deer browsing on this we we We've sort of decided that they tend to like the variegated uh, sanguisorbas better than the non-variegated ones, but they don't seem to want to bend their neck that low to get these. They go for the ones that are, are like just sort of level with their head. Uh, so a lot of the taller ones get browsed, but we've never seen any browse on this. The other thing we've not noticed is the flower doesn't have that sort of kind of little bit creepy smell kind of almost like a corpse kind of smell that some of the much taller sanguisorba fish analysis can have it's quite variable there's a couple that that smell pretty rank but you got to be right on top of them great pollinator plants across the board the the pollinators truly do love the sanguisorbas uh schizocarium scoparium jazz i've noted on here that this was the 2022 perennial plant of the year, but we, we, we elected that as just the species and left everybody across the country to recommend their best cultivar. Um, and so in this, in this case, I selected, all I could select many of them. Um, and we do have, by the way, I do have a grass report that's available on our website, as well as a fine gardening article. Um, I really like this one. It, it's a lot like the blues. For me, the blues was very floppy. I've seen the blues uh, where it's actually quite nice, upright, looks great. But for me, it was always floppy. This one looks like the blues. It's a little bit shorter. It only gets about 36 inches tall, whereas the blues gets more like 48 inches. Um, but it's got a very similar silvery blue leaf, that same sort of vase-shaped habit. Here it is starting to turn uh, to its fall color. It takes on a purple color and ultimately when it's fully in, you know, late in the season into early winter, it's actually more of a coppery color, um, which is really is quite nice. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's, it, like I say, it doesn't flop over. It's a little bit sturdier than a lot of the other ones that um, start out nice and then sort of fall apart as the, as the season goes on. Uh, Spigelia marilandica is a native plant, the Indian pink that I have always loved. I have had, I had had very little luck growing this at the Botanic Garden. I lost it three times before I finally had success growing it in the conditions it wasn't supposed to like at all, which was a hot, dry, full sun situation. Um, but it did really well there. So I've grown this at my own house as well. Uh, it really does prefer uh, consistent moisture. The full sun, light shade, it, it likes both of those, but it really would prefer a, a nice consistent moisture uh, for success. But it is wonderful, these wonderful red flowers. It's most of the species, um, Marilandica has grown from seed. What you buy in the industry is predominantly seed. So that color can vary quite a bit. But if you get a good one, of course, good is dependent on whether you like orange or red. It's a really brilliant red with an almost with a yellow to almost bright chartreuse green mouth and if you notice they they sort of march along the inflorescence it's a it's a one-sided inflorescence they just kind of go in a row um and they flower early mid-june-ish and then they will rebloom they will have a distinct second bloom less than the first time but but distinctly a bloom period in late in sometime in mid to late August. So you do get a good a good um, two times out of this. 
Uh, here it is in my garden at home. I just, unbeknownst to me, because I have a poor memory, I also had those wonderful similarly colored red lilies that came up and that was really quite nice. Uh, and also uh, in the front of the garden here, I have Saruma henrii, which has that same yellow flower. I, this was just total serendipity, but I do love the plant. I, I would have it all over the place if I could. I, I have a volunteer that has, has been complaining to me lately that it is all over her garden. So she dug some up and, I, and brought it to me today. So I'm happy to add, add that to my garden. So there's two selections that are clonal. They're not seed grown. These are done by micropropagation or asexually. There's a little redheaded, little redhead, sorry, which has a really um, dark red and yellow inflorescence. And this you can guarantee because it's clonal, it's always going to be red versus Rage and Cajun, which has the orange flower. But again, both are clones. So when if you get these cultivars, they should be, they should all look alike. Uh, here's a little redhead in the in the garden. Uh, really, just a spectacular little plant. It, it's it's called little redhead, but to be honest, it's the same size as the species, maybe just a little bit shorter. Uh, Stokesia lavis blue frills. Uh, Stokesia is a really substantial aster uh, family plant flower. You can see the inflorescence there. That you know that's about three inches. Some of them can get, can get up to four inches across. Uh, beautiful flower. Um, I think you can kind of see the calyx. They don't call it that in a um, in an aster. It's called a filaries. But you can see they're spiny, and there's spines on the leaves too. But it does it's not going to it's not going to prick you. It's it's not a it's not a, a hard spine. Uh, but that adds some interest to the plant from my point of view. Uh, there it is as a really nice sort of very upright habit loaded with flowers. You can see where there's no flowers, all the buds that are on there. Uh, Blue frills is fairly new, under just under two feet tall for us. Here it is uh, early in its life at the garden. And this is what it looked like this past summer. Uh, you can see it's just gotten bulkier, but look at all those flowers. It is just loaded with flowers. Blooms from mid-July to mid-October, uh, just, just impressive. This is a plant that if you're going to grow this, best not to cut it back in the in the fall. It's let all that foliage and that those flower heads and stuff or fruit heads stunt the water away from it. It doesn't want to sit in water. It wants to be have a fairly dry root zone, especially in the winter time. So if you leave it up, that the water will shunt away from it. Now, in the trials I did, the trial I did, blue frills and honey song purple they were the only two cultivars that never had to be replaced. All the other ones, the really common, popular cultivars, all had to be planted at least twice because they died out over winter. So, in this case, definitely a superior to some of the other ones. I just want to finish up with a couple of Vernonias. These uh, both come from our breeding program. I love Vernonias. I grew them for the trial simply because I love them. Um, but if you if you know Vernonias, they're very large. Majority of them are very large, six, eight, ten, all the way up to fifteen feet tall. They all almost all have the exact same flower. They can be variations in the flower color, very dark purple uh, to a nice bright purple, but beautiful flowers. Amazing pollinator plants. One of the very best pollinator plants, not just for butterflies, for everything. Everything is on these plants when they're in flower. So summer swan song is the smallest of our introduction. It, it tops out at about three feet tall. It's very similar to iron butterfly. If you know that iron butterfly is one of its parents, it differs in a kind of uh, it kind of seems simple, too, too simple to be uh, of real interest, but where it differs is that when the flowers start to grow, they, the, brand, the terminal of the, the stems branch, and those branches interlock, and that interlocking holds this plant together. So unlike uh, iron butterfly, which doesn't do that, this doesn't get pulled apart or knocked down by heavy rains and wind. Um, 
<clears throat> it's got a nice dark green leaf and it's very feathered. You know, you can see that there, it's a very fine textured leaf. So the latest one that's not out yet, but it will be out in the next year or two is summer, uh, Summer's End. This is the mid-range one. So Summer Swan Song, Summer Swan Song is at 36 inches. This is 42 inches. And then we have a third one called Summer Surrender, which is about 48 inches tall. What's interesting about these in side-by-side -side trials, Summer's End drew more monarchs than either of the other two. They were consistently on this and on the other ones, but much lower, you know, much less degree. So uh, I'm not sure what, if that's gonna be everywhere, but I think that's probably something most people would see. The pollinators just seem to like this one better. Uh, here it is, beautiful habit. Ultimately, a solid mass of purple flowers. This is summer swan. This is summer surrender here, and then just down here you're seeing summer swan song, and back here you're seeing uh, iron butterfly. So there it is, about again 42 inches tall and wide. Great, great plants for um, pollinators, and has brought these a lot of these new cultivars aside from being just feathery because of the foliage, have brought it down to a size that I think is manageable for a, a easy, certainly more manageable than a 15 foot Vernoni. Uh, all right, so that is uh, all. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions if there are any. Um, Richard, you do have quite a few or a few questions in the box. Do you want me um, to read them or? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Just the last three at your at the bottom of your stream there. You should be able to see. All right. So is there a list of the plants that are a result of Chicago Botanic Garden breeding program? Yes. If you look, it's 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 a it's a website that is going to be getting uh, uh, overhaul early next year. But if you look on the Chicago land grows dot org website, you will find. Um, the, the herbaceous plants that have been bred by the Chicago Botanic Garden. The woody plants have largely been bred at the Morton Arboretum, which is one of our partners, or through one of the local nurseries. Um, so if you look at Chicago, chicagolandgrows.org, you'll find that list. How do you decide on the plants to evaluate and are evaluations ever sponsored by propagators or growers? Um, when we when we decide on a plant group to look at, we want to always look at a plant group that number one we can learn something about or or learn from. That's always in in the back of my mind. So I like to look at things I don't know well, but I also need to look at plants that the average person is going to understand. So there's a, a multitude of reasons why we select them, but hopefully it's we can contribute to the information base. A lot of times we do it to sort out things like, okay, here's suddenly, you know, 600 new cultivars of this plant. Uh, how should, how could anyone decide what's a good one? I mean, I'm being a little hyperbolic. I, maybe there were 500, but it, you know, it's that kind of thing. I have never had my, my uh, trials directly sponsored by anybody. Now I will say we do get a lot of plant donations from nursery. Uh, and the understanding that they have is that they're, they're going to be given a good, honest, and fair evaluation, and we will give them the annual uh, performance uh, review of the plants. But there's no promise to, you know, to do anything other than give them a fair, fair look at. So we found that over the years, I, it's actually something I'm actually really happy um, that the garden was willing to sponsor our trial so I didn't have to look for outside because you, you can kind of get a feeling sometimes that trials are being paid for by somebody and then that that sometimes makes me question um, are these honest is this an honest evaluation or has this been bought um, which recos for the forest floor type environment, clay soil, shade with dappled sun, as we remove buckthorn underneath. I'm not sure I understand that question. So maybe they can. Do you have any know. recommendations for? What was oh, Rico's recommendation? Is that what that means? We think so. 
Christy, okay, uh, for forest floor type these, these environment, clay good. soil, shade with dappled sun as we remove buckthorn under oaks. Um, besides early flowering columbine, trillium, and, and geraniums. Uh, unfortunately, that that's an actually really big question. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of possibilities you can go with. If you if you um, you know contact me separately, I think my email is on there. I can answer that better. But generally speaking, uh, any plant in that kind of situation, any plant that does shade. But also, are you looking for something that's native to that area? When we removed all the buckthorn from our woodland area, it was amazing the seed bank of native plants that are in already in the soil and have come up. Some that we thought were gone, that just were extinct in the area, came up and have been discovered. So I might try first with um, just seeing what comes up. But another one that's really good, and a lot, a lot of people are using more and more, just carrots. Choose some carrots that are grass like that really do like that kind of environment. Uh, yes, in the case of this Rebecca, they did. Uh, the question is when the Rebecca recedes, does it come back? True. These did come back. These do have the same characteristics of the parent. And that's, you can tell that from the other Rebecca's that were in the trial because they do have the, the, the bristle, bristle hairs on the plant, whereas the other ones do not have that. So they, I didn't, I never let them go to the point where they developed into a plant other than a seedling. And so I can't say for certain that they'll attain the exact characteristic of the parent, but I'm guessing they, they will, or at least be very close. Um, all right, so I think a couple more came in. Uh, yeah, the very bottom uh, somebody, there. Yeah, so you put in the, the Chicagoland Grows thing, that's great. Like I say, just be, be aware that that site needs a lot of work and we know that and we're, we're getting ready to, to work on that in January and February. Are the crepe myrtle evaluations recent and do any of them look promising for our area? So they are, it is a fairly new um, trial for us. We've, we have a few from uh, all the ones that have done really well for us are from Walters Gardens in Michigan. And they've been bred by Walters. Even though Walters in the base, you know, it's a perennial nursery, they're doing these woody plants because they're dieback. So they, they're only meant to be about 30 inches tall and 30 inches wide. They bloom on new wood. So even if they die back to the ground, which they can, um, they do for us, they will come back the next year. We have, they're all in a series called the Barista, Barista series. And so they have done well. I've now, there's a lot more now than there were a few years ago. So my early trial had several selections in it and now I now have a the greater the greater um, collection that just was planted this year but I've had the ones we've had thus far have done well um, off the top of my head I'm drawing a blank on on the actual their names but they all are named after a coffee or some type of a coffee drink um, but again if you want to you want to email me I'm happy to, to give you the lowdown on the ones that thus far have gone through at least two winters, um, if not three. Uh, do you often get spread of disease and pests in adjacent cultivars? So that's actually, I, I'm gonna broaden that question to just point out one of the downsides to a trial, comparative trial, is that you amass a whole lot of plants that are the same or very similar. So if there's a, a disease that hits them, it likely will go through them all. Now, on the positive, the ones that aren't affected, that's a, that's a plus because you realize, okay, this plant must be fairly resistant because some other, some other plant didn't. Now, conversely, when we did our coneflower trial, our multiple coneflower trials, there is a, uh, the leaf hopper that comes up from the south is the one that brings with it the aster yellows, the microplasm. And, I kept getting people, scientists, as well as just average homeowners, to, I, they kept trying to get me to tell them that a plant that was sitting undisturbed or undiseased next to a diseased one was resistant. And I said, maybe the insect got blown down the line and didn't hit that plant. 
I would not tell you that that's resistant. I think that was just the luck of the draw. So then the, the following years, they all succumb. So it, I don't think there's any that are resistant at this point. I certainly don't know of any research that's going in or any breeding that's going into making them resistant to aster yellows. Um, but anyway, yes, that is a problem. Uh, powdery mildew is the same thing uh, when we've done Monarda trials and Phlox paniculata trials. And um, if you have powdery mildew, you may have a lot of it. And like I say, we don't treat for that. Uh, if our plant uh, healthcare people, our staff would tell us that that's a problem that's gonna get out into the general garden, then we would treat for it or we would actually eliminate the trial if it's, if it's a bad, if it's a, it's a bad um, pest. Apparent, I, I'm not actually positive of that. I think that allium lavender bubble sterile. I think I have read that it is sterile. I would take that under advisement. I, I'm, I'm not always positive of what a nursery uh, broadcasts. Uh, sometimes they're, they might be, they may not have looked at it for long enough either, but at this point, I would, I don't know that for a fact. In our trial, I've not seen seedling of it. Many of the others that are out there have reseeded in, and um, Millennium is considered uh, sterile. And I, I believe that at Lavender Bubbles is also, but again, one of those, I think I'd want to prove myself. Um, well, if you, if you, there's a question about what allium recommendations for the central, for central Illinois. Well, certainly now, if you're talking, I, I've only got a great familiar, a, a good familiarity with the perennial or summer flowering alliums, not the bulbs. Um, that's a different, a different thing. And, um, and certainly they, I mean, I've grown many of them, but I've, I've never, I've never evaluated them. If you look in my article, uh, in fine gardening, uh, which I'm not sure it's on our website yet, but it's certainly in a, a, a magazine this year. It will be ultimately posted to our website. Any of those perennial uh, or summer uh, alliums would be fine for you guys. Uh, that will that will not be an issue. Beyond that, there's a, there's species that we haven't grown that you might try, um, but I, I have noticed with the species that we do get a lot of seed. Uh, a lot of seedlings, um, and then they do tend to hybridize with other things that are in the uh, in the mix uh, that are in the trial garden. But uh, again, so there's I, I I think that the alliums are so easy to grow. Um, I don't think you guys would have trouble with pretty much anything. Uh, that's all I see here. I don't know if there's anything I missed above, but I'm happy. Oh, got another one just popped in. Uh, you guys will have to tell me when I, when I'm done. When okay. you when you want everyone to go home. This will be your last question, and then we have another one here. Okay, I have an Amstonia blue star, and it really creeps where I don't want it. Will the verdant venture stay put? Now, when uh, I'm assuming by creeps, you mean it's reseeding? Uh, is that also they do also reseed? They don't spread by they don't spread by underground. Um, they don't spread by underground things, so it would be reseeding. We have never seen a seedling on this. Um, uh, this. This has been managed and observed so meticulously for 12 years before we introduced it that I have never, it has always been that perfect five foot circle that you guys saw a picture of. Um, it is no plants around it and we never see any seedling. So I would say no in, in the case of Verdant Venture. Uh, thank you, whoever, to Anne, who said it was superb, I appreciate that. I know there's quite a few clematis planted in the evaluation area. Are you doing that? Yes, we we are currently doing a trial, a small, all things considered, a small trial of clematis of selections or cultivars that I have never grown, and they're only big, they're only big flowered clematis. Well, predominantly big flowered. There are a few intergafolia, the non-climbing selections that that are in the trial. There's only 37 at this point. But over the years, I think we probably trialed over 200 different clematis uh, that we've reported on. Um, I have limited space. I do in my new, in the new shade evaluation garden, we do have uh, space for, um, for clematis, but based on the amount of thing and the replication, because we like to do three plants of anything, 
we really only have room for about 30, um, 37 or 38 uh, plants, um, or, you know, types, put times three uh, is all the space we have available. But yes, clematis is one of my favorite groups. Actually, pretty much anything in the buttercup family, which what's that then, which also includes um, uh, aqualesia and hellebores and, and um, selectrums and things like I love I love that group and clematis are wonderful, wonderful plants. All right. Okay, thank you. I have one more question that was uh, submitted to us actually before you spoke, and it might apply to uh, everyone. So uh, one of the uh, person who manages some of the gardens in our university arboretum here has said she has not been totally successful with recommendations made um, through your lists. And um, short of questioning her horticultural abilities, is there anything that you know about the difference between us and you up in Chicago that we should take into consideration in uh, trying these different perennials? Um, well, it'd be interesting to know what, what actually is, what, what the issue is, if, if, meaning just I've recommended things that didn't do well for you guys. So here's the thing. I know, and I'm not, and I make no secret of the fact that we're looking at plants in a specific area. But if you're a good horticulturist or good gardener, and you know the, the, the qualities of the site that we've grown plants in and the weather conditions and all that, you, you can spread that. You can stretch that and figure, does that work for you? I mean, I'm working with, what, what zone are you guys? I assume six? Five B. Well, you're so, so you're five B. I've got heavy, heavy clay soils, either dry as dust or wet. I, I have, um, you know, vagaries of winter. We, some, some years don't have any snow. Other years we have feet of snow. Uh, so some years we have frost heaving on everything. And some years the plants come through winter and they're glorious. I mean, I don't consider anything about my site to be a positive, you know, at its at its essence. So I I I stand behind. I never I will never say that you you it's your fault that you didn't see what I saw, but I will always stand behind. I did see what I saw, and we've done it for four years, and we've got a good background. So I, I would be interested to know what what has failed and what the conditions are under which the plants fail that they would, because none of, none of these plants and rarely any plant I talk about is, I would consider esoteric plants that just need extra, um, extra care or extra, you know, sort of attention. Uh, I, I, I joke about it, but it's, it's, I'm deadly, I'm deadly serious. I am the laziest gardener there is. And if I, and I do grow a lot of these at home because if I like them at work, then I, I have them at home as well. And if it, if, if it's here, it's probably getting less care than it does at the Chicago Botanic Garden where it gets no care. Cause I really don't like, I really am not, I'm lazy. It's not, I'm a bad gardener. I'm just a lazy gardener. I, I, so anyway, so yeah, if so, you know, they feel free to reach out to me and let me know. Uh, well, we did actually plant? ask for some details and didn't get them. So okay. we understand completely. And just right now, I would like to thank you so much. This was a fantastic presentation. I want to echo all of those people who on the chat have said how much they've enjoyed it. Um, we really appreciate your being here, Richard. And for I the rest of the that. people who are watching, please take time to fill out our poll. Thank you again, sir. All righty.